Well, this morning we're going to carry on with this Uniqueness of Jesus series. And this morning I want to talk about uh, the uniqueness of Jesus as seen in the fact that he was a man of conviction. I don't mean conviction like, like criminal, like, 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 like a convict, uh, but conviction in the sense of holding a strong, uh, a strong stance or a strong position and living by that position. In our world, it's actually quite easy to see that this is something that can be sorely lacking. So what would you do if someone criticized the way you raised your kids? Oof, I got a strong reaction. <laughs> what would you do if someone disagreed with how you spend your money? What would you do, what would you do if someone came along and challenged your beliefs? You see, our responses to some of those kind of situations, whether it's something that's happening in our lives or something that's happening around us, often require a level of conviction that we're not used to displaying. It's sort of like if you're in a, if you're in a restaurant and somebody starts acting rudely to somebody else, and it's sort of like, well, it's not really my problem, but yet, you know, something, something not right is happening. Right? Well, if I interfere, then I'm being nosy. But if I do nothing, then, then I'm kind of just letting something bad happen to the people or the world around me. And let's face it, we're Canadians. We'd rather be nice. We'd rather not get involved. We'd rather not barge into somebody else's life or somebody else's situation. But there are times when conviction is necessary. There are times when being able to plant our two feet somewhere and to say, this is where I stand, no matter what it may cost. There are moments when this is simply required in being a follower of Jesus. And in fact, it is something Jesus himself modeled. And he modeled it very, very well for us, what it means to live in conviction. You see, our response, our response to difficult situations, whether it's relational or things that are happening in our life that we can't control, our responses to those things are going to reveal both to us and to the world around us what our true convictions actually are. Those convictions that are those, those beliefs that we hold that are unshakable. Those beliefs that we hold that we cannot be moved from regardless of what anybody else might say or do. And even as I say that, I, I can see the wheels turning. At, at the end of our, our, of our time here together, I'm going to ask the simple question, what are the convictions that you live by? Now, don't, don't worry. You may not be able to easily identify them because it's not a very common question. You don't go up for coffee with someone and just say, what are your convictions? And it's kind of like, uh, well, gee, I've got my convictions notebook. Let me pull it out and you know, turn to page three and I can tell you what they are doesn't work like that. But spend an hour with somebody in a difficult situation, and you'll know what their convictions are. You'll know what keeps them rooted. Or you'll know if there's a lack of things that keep them rooted. So this morning, we're going to explore what it means for Jesus to leave us this example of being someone who lives by conviction. You see, Jesus lived a life of conviction. And there's so many examples that I wanted to use. But I also want to honor your time. So <laughs> I've picked a few to go through this morning to highlight that Jesus was a man of conviction. The first story comes from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched out it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. 
Seems rather extreme. It almost seems like, if, if, if you were to look uh, maybe on the surface of the story, it almost looks like Jesus is picking a fight. Am I right? It, it kind of looks like he's sort of doing things just just to trap the Pharisees and just to point a finger at them and just to prove a point. But if you look deeper, Jesus is operating out of his conviction. He's operating in a way that is immovable despite the hatred that the religious leaders held for him. He was living by conviction and he was acting out those convictions. And it's almost like you can see in Jesus a sense where he is undeterred, where he is resolute. It's like it doesn't matter who's, who's yapping and barking over here, that he is doing something that is powerful and important. But not to highlight himself, but to live by conviction. He was doing something with a strong purpose. So either Jesus was breaking the rules being a rebel, being someone who's just out to prove a point and you can't boss me around and, and you don't know what you're talking about. Or, he was performing this miracle to demonstrate that doing good is more important than observing rules. I can remember it was uh, December the 12th of 2001. The further back dates go, the harder they are to pinpoint. Anybody relate to that? And uh, Dania was going into labor with our second son. And we were living in Kelowna at the time. It was about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. He was overdue because he lives on his own time, and that's true to this day. So we just kind of learned to go with the flow. So he was late, and actually that day, Dania was said to be induced. But Kyle decided that he didn't want to be induced. He decided he was going to come before... And so, right, right, on, right on the clock, one minute before Daniel was scheduled to be induced, he was born. Anyway, so, <laughs> slid right in there. Anyway, so we're driving to the hospital, and it's early morning in Kelowna, and like early morning in the city, like the lights are usually flashing, right? Flashing green or flashing yellow. It's kind of like, you know, you can do your thing, but just make sure that you're being cautious. Well, there's not a whole lot of caution when your wife is in labor. And from where, Denise, uh, from where we lived uh, to the hospital is about 15 minutes downtown. And so it's sort of like, you know, we're racing down the hill, and it's sort of like every time we come to an intersection, it's sort of like slow down, and like quick, 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 and keep going. Now, in a moment like that, am I overly concerned about the rule of how fast you should be going on Springfield Road in Kelowna? Probably not, because there's something slightly more important than the rule. I want to get my wife to the hospital. I want to have a safe baby delivery. And, and, and that took precedence over the rule. Now, I don't do that any other time except when it's necessary. Usually. I'm human. So in this story, Jesus is living and acting out of a conviction that it's better to do good than to follow the rule. And of all the rules to follow, this is one of the ones that the religious leaders, for some reason, cared about the most. It seems to be one of the most sacred rules that they held. Now, it is a command, right? If you read the Ten Commandments, we're told to keep a Sabbath. And we can talk a little bit more about what Sabbath actually means in, you know, in, a, different, in a different setting or on a different Sunday morning. But the point is, the religious leaders took the rule and, and they expanded it to be something that God never intended. And so Jesus isn't trying to point out their fault. He's actually set on doing good. And in doing good, he found himself in tension with the Pharisees. Does that make sense? He's not looking for a fight. He's doing what is important and what is necessary because he has conviction. And it doesn't matter what it costs him. Because it's the right thing to do. It seems to be a dying art or, or, or a lost idea. But doing, Jesus lived by the conviction that doing nothing, yes, doing nothing is wrong when you have the ability to do good, regardless of the rules. I just said it slightly different. Doing the right thing is more important than living by the rule. 
when there's nothing more important, there's nothing wrong with living by the rules, right? You know, there's your speed limit and, and you know, counting your calories or whatever the rule happens to be. It's all right. But we don't become a slave to those things when something more important is happening. Jesus modeled it and lived it. But he didn't go looking for fights. I like that about Jesus. It's almost like he had this, this resolute focus that was never wavering despite anything that was happening around him or anybody that was trying to throw shade at him. So the second story, this comes from Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 10. Is it big enough to read? I hope so. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No kidding. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You're kind of like, what a cool power encounter. Right? Like the enemy's trying to throw everything he has at Jesus, and Jesus has a defense for everything he's trying to, everything he's trying to pull off. And it's sort of like Jesus comes out of the desert and he's, he's triumphant. He's gone out for his testing. He's triumphed over the enemy. And the story continues that when Jesus comes out of the desert, he begins his ministry. And there's power. And there's change. People are healed. The, the, the sick are made well. The lame are walking. The blind are receiving sight. Demons are being cast out. It's almost like this was a preparatory moment for Jesus. He had to go through this trial in order to be able to begin his ministry effectively. But there's something that we miss. If you've heard this passage preached before, you've probably heard someone like me standing on a stage, something like this, saying, it's important to know God's word. Anybody heard that about this passage before? Know God's word because it helps you to resist temptation. And it's true. So I won't, I won't deny that. So I'm not going to try and contradict that. But I think the deeper part of what's happening here is Jesus is living not just with the understanding that God's word is important, but he's living with a conviction that it's transformative. He lived by the conviction that God's word is powerful and able to fight off temptation because he was standing in it. He didn't just know it. You know, the truth of Scripture is that the enemy knows the Bible too. In, in, in James... James says, you believe in God, that's good. Well, guess what? Even the demons believe. So belief in itself is not, uh, not belief in the sense of placing your faith in Christ, but believing that God is real is not enough. Because the enemy believes he's real. Jesus lived by this conviction that, that God's word is not only truth to be understood, but truth that is transformative in how it helps us to fight our daily battles. That it's not just the memorization of Bible verses, which, which is good and healthy, but, but if it doesn't reach its way to our heart, if it's not something that we're actually standing on and convinced of, and, and it's burrowed its way deep enough that it's unshakable within us, then it's easy for the Word to just kind of come and go. A lot of believers lack power in their life because the transforming nature of the Word has not been birthed deeply enough in their soul. To believe it's true is good. But the enemy also believes that it's true. It's also transformative. The truth that his Word reveals is transformative and it's enough for us to stand on so that as we live it, as it grips our heart, we become more unmovable. We become more firm in our footing. So when we hear something that sounds like it may be good, but doesn't quite sound right, it's because we know what his word says, and it's like, that sounds a little off to me. Or when the cultural winds of change blow, right? When we start talking about 
a lot of hot button issues in our culture, and there's a, there's a good handful of them. And I don't want to cause any controversy by pinpointing any of them right now. But there's many of those things that we start to ask, well, what should we think about this issue or that issue? What should we think about this thing that people say is true? Is it really true? We can't navigate those waters unless we have a conviction about the truth of his transforming word. That his word is not just a word on, a, on, a, on paper, but it's an eternal word that guides and transforms. It is a solid platform that we can stand on. And when we know the truth of what he's saying, then when we hear other things, whether it's other people or the cultural winds blow, we're not as easy to be moved off of that platform. So I see it as part of my role to try and communicate that truth in a way that, that lands in, in, in real life. So that it can take root. So that when those, when those things come into your life, you go, oh, I think I know what this, what this means. I need, I need to live like this, or I need to make this kind of decision, or I need, to, I need to talk to Jesus about this because he wants to lead me, and he wants to guide me. These are the things that become the convictions that we stand on because his word digs deep enough and takes root and becomes the thing that, that, that penetrates the fiber of our being and transforms how we think and how we live. I think that's how Jesus viewed it. That his word is not just something to understand and know, but it's something that transforms and guides our very thoughts, our very patterns. The way that we live should be rooted in these, in these truths and principles. A third story, coming from Matthew 18, verse 18 to 21. This one is a little bit more strange, but that's okay. Sometimes Jesus is strange. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Are you with me that that sounds a little strange? I hope so. Because if it makes more sense to you than me, then we should trade places. <laughs> Doesn't it seem a little harsh? Let the dead bury their own dead and come and follow me. Like, hokey smokes. What is, what is Jesus trying to say? Is he telling the guy, don't bother follow? If you're, if you're going to go to a funeral, then you've got no place following me. Well, if that's the case, then anybody who's ever attended a funeral has no business following Jesus. So like, that can't be what he means. So what does he mean? This is another moment where Jesus is living by conviction. Where, where, where the truth is his way of living and standing. So it would be, uh, for, for, any, for any human, it would be nice to hear those words. I want to be like you. Anybody ever said that to you? I want to be just like you. Maybe kids, your mom, dad, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. But I imagine it would be fun to hear those words. Maybe a little flattering, you know, maybe a little affirming or, or encouraging that somebody sees something in you that's worth emulating or imitating. That's, that's kind of a nice feeling. But Jesus is not moved by that part of the conversation. Jesus is more moved by his conviction that it's more important to tell people the truth, than it is to feel good. Jesus is sharing a difficult truth here. It's better to be truthful and direct than to be kind and dishonest. We are Canadians. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> we are Canadians. If we're going to make a mistake, no, just, just nod if you, if you think this is true. We would rather be kind, save somebody's feelings, and shade the truth just a little bit, or ignore it altogether, than to... Ah, even pointing feels funny, you know? Like you don't have to put a finger in somebody's chest to be honest, but, but even, even as I think out loud about 
about being, being direct and, and, and honest about what a situation really is. It, it goes against my Western Canadian sensibilities. And culturally speaking, it's easy to offend people today too, so it's, it's kind of like a double whammy. One, we're a nice culture to begin with. But we also live in a culture where to say anything about anybody else is like, whoa, man, you're oppressive. Here's the truth I need you to hold on to. Maybe this applies to you. I hope it doesn't. But if it doesn't, I bet my last nickel that you know somebody that it applies to. Somebody, some people, say that they have been hurt by church. And, it's, and, and some of those things are legitimate, right? Because people are people. This is not a place where perfect people exist, just so that everybody's clear. But sometimes people experience hurt because somebody cared enough to love them well and deeply, and they took it the wrong way, and they blamed somebody else for their situation. Sometimes that hurt beca comes because somebody lived by the conviction that it's better to be honest and kind at the same time than it is to spare somebody's feelings. Jesus lived by that conviction. What did it cost him? It cost him his life. As he lived this way, the religious leaders got more angry and more angry and more angry to the point where they were willing to lie about him to hand him over to the Romans. They were willing to bring false witnesses to testify against Jesus just so that he could be sentenced to death by the Romans. Jesus lived and modeled the conviction that it's better to be truthful and direct than to be kind and dishonest. <sighs> Tell me if that's landing. Because that's hard for me. Because I, I like people. But when was the last time somebody sat next to you or across the table for you and said, hey, I, I, don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but you've got a rough spot that's hurting some people in your life. Can we have a conversation about that? Now, like, like even, even saying something like that out loud is like, okay, now you're, you're almost into unventured territory. But here's Jesus. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. I've got nowhere to lay my head. So if you want to follow me, expect to be uncomfortable. That is not a great drawing card. We, we have Tim, uh, Tim Lovelace coming on December 12th, as, uh, as Ken mentioned at the beginning of the service. He's, a, he's a, a songwriter and a comedian. Now, if he wasn't funny and had no musical skills, what would it be like to go and see a show? He'd be like, uh, I want my money back. This is just not what I what I ordered, not what I bargained for, right? No, I think he's every bit as, as talented as, 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 as everything I've heard, so it's going to be a good show. But he's not pretending, right? He's got the real goods. Jesus is living by the conviction that it's better to give somebody a real picture than it is to, to spare them a sense of emotional well-being. That's hard today, man. That's hard when the slightest word can offend. But I can tell you, I've done some of the best growing in my life when somebody had the courage to point things out that I needed to change. I can't remember the proverb, because, and, and I didn't think of it when I was putting this together. But there's a proverb that says, better the wounding of a friend than the kind words of an enemy. It's true. I would rather hear from people who know me, who love me, who trust me, who are connected to my life. I'd rather hear from them to point things out. And maybe, maybe it saves us in the end. Maybe someone loving us to that degree actually saves us hassle later on. Because you don't want that thing to pop up its ugly head in a bad situation. Like if you're you know, in court before a judge. You don't want your anger issues to come out when you're standing before a judge. That's just not very good. It's not wise. Not that I expect any of you are going to be in court today or anything like that, but it's a conviction that it's better to say what needs to be said, to say it in a way that's loving, to say it in a way that's direct, so that somebody else has the choice to do what they want with it. We can never choose how somebody receives something, but we can choose whether or not we say something. 
And it doesn't mean we go jumping into everybody else's business, but it means when the time is right, and when it's up to us to say something, then by God we must say something. To do it kindly. To do it with gentleness. Jesus lived by this, and it cost him. It cost him a lot. One more. From Matthew chapter 9. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, that's Matthew the tax collector, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, what does your teacher, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. That's a cool story. That's a cool story. And again, Jesus isn't looking for a fight. But he's living by conviction that everybody who needs to hear should hear. He's living by the conviction that his purpose was far greater than his reputation. His purpose was far greater than his reputation. Don't show your hands on this one. How many hours have each of us spent worrying and fretting, being concerned with somebody else's opinion of us? Whether you're five years old and somebody says your pigtails are ugly, or whether we're 15 and said, who taught you how to run? You look like a, look like a gangly lizard with three legs. Do we really care that much about what people think of us? Should we really care that much about what people think of us? If I were to ask you, who do the people who are closest to you think you are? You would give some pretty good answers. If you were honest, you might say, well, I don't want to say because then I'm bragging. I'm not asking you to brag. But the people who are closest to you know who you are. And you know what? They know who you are, good, bad, and ugly. And we all have good and bad and ugly. So if the people who know you most, the people who are closest to you, if they love you anyway, despite the bad and the ugly, and if God loves us perfectly, then what does it matter what so-and-so thinks? What does it matter what so-and-so thinks? It doesn't. This is a wonderful, life-giving conviction. It means you can set yourself towards everything that God has for you to be and to do, and whatever anybody else thinks of it, guess what? Is 100% irrelevant. Irrelevant. Now, the good people in your life will challenge you, will encourage you, will motivate you, will help to rub off your, your rough edges as they are honest with you and, and help you along. But there's certainly not going to be people who are against you. They're not going to be people who are going to badmouth you behind your back. The people that do those kind of things aren't actually worth our friendship. By value, they are loved. But by time, that's a waste. You see the difference? They're valued because God loves them. But if they're the kind of person who treats you wrong or talks about you behind your back, they're actually not worth your time. Jesus called it casting pearls before swine. It's another one of his harsh sayings that's 100% true. Not just because Jesus said it, but because he knew it was true and said it. That's a hard truth. That's a hard, hard truth. His purpose was far greater than his reputation. And boy, did he take some hits on his reputation. At one point, the Pharisees even called him demon-possessed. Jesus, can you imagine? <laughs> the Son of God, the sinless one, the one who came to take away the sins of the world, the religious leaders got to a point where they're like, well, he's either crazy or he's demon-possessed. Guess how much it bothered Jesus about that much? 
He said, a house divided against itself simply cannot stand. So if I cast out demons, which was the context of, their, of the Pharisees' comment, if I cast out demons by the power of the devil, then I am part of a house that is going to crumble and not stand. But if I cast out demons by the hand of God, then the kingdom has come upon you. Friends, we could look, that, we could look at that as Jesus pointing at them and, 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 and judging them. Or we can look at it as Jesus acting in the conviction that he needs to speak the truth regardless of what it cost him. He was giving the religious leaders every opportunity to turn around and follow him. He was giving them every opportunity to capture the right truths to embrace him as the one that they had been praying for for hundreds and hundreds of years. Because of the hardness of their heart, they couldn't see it. But Jesus still made it clear for them. Because his purpose, which means anybody who's willing can come, his purpose was more important than his reputation. That's a good one. That's one of my favorites. So why is having convictions necessary for a believer? Like It kind of sounds like it's all very confrontational. We're all very negative. But here, here's a few reasons why having these deep-rooted convictions is necessary for a believer. They keep us from temptation when we live by a higher value. I love the fact that in Matthew 4, when Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and it says, and he was hungry. Like I just love that. It's like, duh, of course he was. But why did it say that? said that because the enemy came and tried to tempt him through his hunger. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Have yourself a little meal. You've earned it. Give yourself a Kit Kat. Give yourself a break. Anybody remember that? I've probably heard it too many times. Convictions keep us from temptation because they, they bring us to a higher value. We live by a higher truth than the truth of our own hunger. Does that make sense? They keep us from being idle or silent when there is good to be done. Man, there are times when there's so much good that can be done. But just so that it's clear, your responsibility is not to do every good. It's not your job to go looking for every good to possibly do. But when there is good to be done... Conviction compels us to do that good, regardless of what it may cost us, regardless of what somebody might think, regardless of whether it means speaking one of those truthful words that might be hard for somebody to hear. There's lots of different goods that can be done. But when it presents itself to you by God's design, that conviction says, I, I, I'm compelled to do this. I need to do this. Because I know if I don't, I'm missing on an opportunity that God has created. And even if you miss an opportunity, he still loves you and that's okay. But as those convictions work their way deeper and deeper, they pull us out of that, that sense of being comfortable or safe and into a realm where we're willing to take risks. Having convictions keeps us from the trap of needing or wanting to be a people pleaser. Oh, yeah. As a recovering people pleaser holic. I can testify to how freeing it is to live by conviction than in pleasing people. I'm growing to love a great many people as I get involved here. But I don't need to be loved by a thousand people to feel value. It feels nice, but I don't need it to feel secure in my identity. Because if I were the last person on planet Earth, I would still have friend Jesus. And that means something. Conviction keeps us from needing or wanting to be a people pleaser. That's a hard one. And they bring clarity to otherwise confusing situations. Sometimes we encounter situations, should I act like this or should I act like this? Should I say something? Should I not say something? Should I do this thing? Should I not do this thing? When we have convictions deeply rooted, the path forward becomes a lot clearer, even if it feels weird or uncomfortable, or even if it stretches our faith. 
So how do we develop and adopt conviction? Well, the first one is, is, is obvious enough, being rooted in God's word and truth. Now, I hope, I hope you understand by now that I, I don't mean just reading his word. It is important to read his word, but it's more important to encounter God in his word. Because God is the one who made the truth that the word testifies to. When you open the scriptures, uh, a mentor of mine once said, you are one Holy Spirit breath away from a fresh encounter with God. And it's true, because they are his breathed words to us. And they have life. And those life-giving words can be deeply rooted in our soul, where they become convictions that we stand on and where we are unmovable. By being rooted in God's character. Man, I'm telling you, this is a game changer. If you believe that God is always for you and never against you, how would that change how you live? How would that change how you live if you knew that God was always for you and never against you? How would it change how you think to know that no matter what's happening in our life, He is only one word away? No matter what we've done, no matter how far we wander, no matter what we've done in our past, that He is as close as the very breath you breathe, and He's not intimidated by your life or your circumstance. He's not even intimidated when you're angry with him. Can I give you permission? Some of you need permission to be angry with God about something. He can take it. He's got big daddy shoulders. He already knows it's there. Why be dishonest? Doesn't serve any purpose to try and hide it from him. How would it change how we live if we knew he was always there and was never nervous? We're never against us. I think it would change a lot. I think it would change a lot. A third way to develop and adopt convictions is being rooted in our true identity. That Jesus died for you. That is the one thing that should settle your value. The one thing that should settle your value is the fact that Jesus died for you the only thing that gives us our value. We can't make it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't steal it. We can't forge it. Our identity is given to us by the one who made us. When we're rooted in that reality, it gives us a conviction about who we are. Lastly, by being rooted in our purpose. Jesus' purpose was to seek and to save the lost, and he didn't care what it cost him. And it cost him a lot. Do you know what your God-given purpose is? Do you know why he put you on planet Earth? If you don't, that's a great question to ask him. Every week when we we finish our message, we we give time uh, uh, for Jesus to speak to us. And maybe that's a great thing to ask him when we close in prayer today. Jesus, why am I here? Why have you put me on planet Earth? It may not be to be a, you know, a missionary or, or a pastor or a big leader. It might be just to be exactly who you are, doing exactly what you're doing, but to find a joy in it because that's who God has made you to be. That's fine. We need good lawyers and plumbers and farmers and teachers and grocery store clerks. We need all of those things. So it's not about trying to find something higher and bigger and better and awesomer. But it's about asking Jesus who he has made you to be. What difference is he asking you to make in this world? When we're rooted in that purpose, it gives us a direction that is unshakable. And honestly, a lot of fun. It's very adventurous. So what are the convictions that you live by? What are those moments that you can think of in your life when you felt like, this is the ground I stand on and I actually can't be moved from this ground? That's a conviction you hold. Maybe it's worth thinking about 
What are the things that are unshakable in your life? And where did they come from? Maybe some of them come from the family that you grew up in. Right? Mom and dad modeled something and you just adopted it as your own. Maybe it's come from his word. Maybe it's come from your experiences. But in the same way that we can have good and godly convictions, we can also have negative convictions. We can also have negative convictions. Just, I don't want to go into that, that part of things, but just, just be aware. Maybe we have a conviction that's not totally right. Here's just one for an example. You can have a conviction that you're never going to let somebody else hurt you again. Is that true? This world is full of imperfect people. And hurt can come from all different directions. But if you have a conviction that you're going to do everything to avoid being hurt, you're going to avoid all the good stuff too. There's no way around it. If you hide from the bad, you hide from the good. If you put up a wall, it keeps out the bad, and it keeps out the good. So as we pray, let God just surface some of those convictions in your life that are good, and celebrate that, because that's the work of God in your life. But maybe also think about a conviction that you hold that maybe isn't rooted in truth. And you know, and if God wants you to see something, he'll, he'll help you to see it, and if not, don't worry about it. They're there, and when the time is right, he'll show you. Now that I've talked about it, you'll probably hear lots of things over the next several weeks. It's just kind of the way he does things. But as we pray, let those things surface. I want to pray a blessing for you, that God would take those convictions, make them more deeply rooted, that he would root you even deeper in his word and give you new convictions. It will transform your life. It will transform your relationships, your sense of purpose, your direction, how things around you influence you or don't influence you. Let's let Jesus do that work for us as we pray together. Lord, I am so convinced, and I use that word intentionally, I'm convinced that you have a perfect design for everything. We don't always get to see or experience that perfect design because we live in a fallen world and we ourselves are fallen people. And yet you can still transform our lives. You can still transform the world around us. You can give us these convictions that become deeply rooted in our being so that the way we experience a broken life can have more meaning, where we can even feel a sense of your presence in ways that we haven't been able to before because we're rooted in the right things. Thank you, Jesus, that you modeled what it means to be a person with conviction. We want to have the right convictions. We want to have the right truths settled deeply in our soul so that as we live, that we're not bombarded by things that will knock us off course so that we're not easily influenced or swayed by cultural winds that blow to try and tell us what is really important because we're rooted in your truth and we're rooted in our purpose and rooted in our identity. So Jesus, if you would put into our minds those convictions that we hold that are good, so that we can hold on to them even stronger. What are those convictions in our lives? Well, thank you that you have placed those convictions there. They are a, a living testimony to your work in our hearts. And if there's any negative convictions that we hold that need to be surrendered and abandoned, would you pinpoint those in our lives as well in this moment?
whatever those negative convictions might be, Jesus, we abandon them now. We recognize them as probably something of our own making that's designed to protect ourselves or to keep ourselves safe or to avoid uh, something that we fear. We give you permission, Jesus, to replace any of those negative convictions with something that is rooted in who you are, rooted in truth. And Lord, we don't want to take uh, just a moment as well to simply ask you the question, why have you put each one of us, why have you put me and anybody here, why have you put us here on planet Earth? Why have you made us? What is our purpose? For some it might be clear, and for others it might be a little hazy. Keep your heart open as God would lead you in the days to come to solidify uh, speaking to you about what your purpose is. Lord, I just feel that you, uh, that you want me to say even out loud that our first and primary purpose is to seek you with all of our heart. That all other things pale in comparison to looking for you and finding you. That you are the one true treasure that our heart desires. I just pray for each one of us here to embrace that as our first priority, our first reason for being. To pursue God with all of our heart and to love Him. Thank you, God, that it's actually quite, the idea is quite simple. That you've made it easy enough for us to grasp. So we want to do that. Help us to use our, our time, our energy well to pursue you. And as we do that, you will make all of these things more abundantly clear. Thank you that you love us and that you show us those things. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.